Thank you. I want to um, I want to uh, reiterate what <laughs> Matt just said. Is thank you all of you for being um, here today um, in what has been I thought just a fabulous fabulous conference. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I do want to take a minute or two to talk about um, about um, William H. Brownlee, after whom this um, uh, lectureship is named. Um, he was an American Bible scholar. Uh, and he was a junior fellow at the American Schools of Oriental Research in Jerusalem when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. And he, he was like the guy who was in the hallway when the phone rang, and they're like, we've got these scrolls, right? I mean, like, literally, right? That's what it was. And we've heard um, uh, his daughter is here today, and we, we've had scholars in the past come and talk about um, the correspondence between um, Brownlee and his wife about you know, what that felt like and what that was. Um, he published many works on the Dead Sea Scrolls, and he was, um, he then became a professor of religion at Claremont Graduate University, it was graduate school at the time, and, um, and director of, the, of their Dead Sea Scrolls project, um, retiring in 1982. Um, it, unfortunately, he did not get to enjoy his retirement for long and passed away shortly thereafter, and his family dedicated this, um, this lectureship to the university in 1983. Um, and um, one of the things that um, most impresses me about the Brownlee Memorial Lecture is that Brownlees are always here. Um, and so I'd like to point out um, Edgar uh, Terry and Martha Brownlee Terry. And um, and um, their, their children often come, um, and um, their oldest son um, just had babies, so that's why he's not here. And so um, I hope that in um, the next year or two, we will have the next generation of, of Terry Brownleys attending um, uh, this uh, lectureship. Um, but it is quite um, a, a testimony to who he must have been that, um, what, 30 some odd years, late, 40 years, <laughs> uh, 40 years later, the Brownleys continue to, um, to support not only this lectureship, but, but, but attend it. Um, and so um, for me, uh, when I first got here, I, I gave a Brownlee lecture um, while your mother was still alive. And, um, and it was, it was for, for me, that is something really special about Claremont Graduate University, that our donors are not just random people who give money and leave, but, um, but, but they are here and stay with us and we with them. So that is why this lectureship is so important, one of the many reasons. Um, and today, I'm quite excited that Philip Barlow will be providing this lecture. Um, in case you were not here all day long, um, many of his um, works have been referenced at um, previous talks today. Um, he um, is presently uh, Neil A. Maxwell Senior Research Associate and the Associate Director, Director of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at uh, BYU. He received degrees at Weber State College and Harvard Divinity School. He has taught at the University of Rochester, Hanover College, and then he held the Leonard J. Arrington Chair of Mormon History and Culture at Utah State University. So I always say CGU has the first chair in Mormon studies outside the state of Utah, and he's the only person who sort of beat us to it by holding the chair, but I was in Utah, so it doesn't count. Um, or it's too obvious, yes. Um, while his list of articles and co-edited volumes is impressive, for today I will just lift up two. One is his Religion and Public Life in the Midwest, America's Common Denominator, question mark, um, which is one volume in an eight volume religion by region set. Um, and for today in particular, um, his volume on Mormons and the Bible, The Place of the Latter-day Saints in American Religion, published by Oxford in 91 and again in 97, and then in a digital version, I think, in 2003. Oh, okay, just a new edition. Um, and one of the things I love about that volume is that he received the, um, the Mormon History Association Award for Best First Book for that volume, which has seen numerous reprints. Um, so thank you for that. Um, in, um, 
In his work, in that particular work, he analyzes Latter-day Saint uses of the biblical text, including issues revolving around the LDS Church's official backing of the King James translation, which, um, which we've just heard a little bit about in our previous talk. Tonight, he will be talking about, I guess it's still afternoon, we believe the Bible to be the word of God as far as it is translated correctly, an exegetical sketch. Thank you. Tammy, did you just call me obvious? Don't be defensive, Tim. I've been, my whole family thinks I'm obvious. And, um, it's good that I, that makes me feel at home here. Um, I too would like to thank uh, sponsors who make such um, a lecture as this um, possible. I don't take that. There's a lot of ways to spend one's um, wealth and one's family's wealth over the years and uh, being constructive in this particular way is um, important and I'm grateful and to Matt and everybody who's made the uh, this all possible today including the fabulous uh, scholars and thinking that's gone on here what a nice day it's been um, made me want to rewrite my talk at every point after I heard um, the sessions and want to be in dialogue with these um, excellent minds, so I'm thankful for the privilege. I did think um, as I arrived yesterday and spent time with an old childhood pal and wandered Claremont a little bit and vicinity that none of them seemed uh, aware of our conference and uh, um, seemed to care very much that we were going to be here talking about the Bible. I didn't bring the subject up and they didn't bring the subject up, they just drove by. And um, I've also been feeling as you have the heaviness and anxiety and suffering um, that's been in, our, in the world uh, in our time, always the best of times and always the worst of times, but seems kind of heavy right now and why am I not embarrassed to be here on a Saturday afternoon talking about the Bible while the world bleeds and writhes and worries and uh, that's because I really am not a preachy academic I really truly am a convert to the proposition that we need a group of volunteer thoughtful people to think carefully as the liberal arts, uh, as we humans have fashioned the artificial things we call disciplines to um, ponder explicitly or implicitly uh, the question of what it means to be a human being and what it means to be a human being together in such a universe and world as we find ourselves in and to ask the question, how should we go about this? It's very strange here. Century, 16 centuries ago, Augustine invented what some critics consider the first autobiography, first real autobiography with an interior probing to it rather than an autobiography that was um, transparent or less transparent, chest beating about I've conquered this or I went and did this great thing but an interior autobiography that was probing himself and what it meant to be a human. The entire first autobiography, or certainly for Western civilization, um, is fashioned, as you remember, in the form of a prayer. It's, if you thought Enos prayed a long time, this was a very long um, prayer, Augustine's Confessions. And, in the course of addressing God for that long, the book observes, you have made us and drawn us to yourself. You have made us and drawn us to yourself and our heart is restless until it rests in thee. One need not believe in God to recognize Augustine may have been onto something. For human beings are naturally self-transcendent creatures. We have this weird magic superpower 
to stand outside ourselves to some degree. Think of Rodin's thinker, if it helps you as an icon, to stand outside ourselves sufficiently to ponder ourselves. Indeed, we seemed hotwired for that exercise. And self-transcendence has led many humans to imagine or to sense a transcendent transcendence, that is, the divine beyond themselves. Again, you don't have to believe in the divine to notice that about humans. It's one of the most distinctive things about humans. When I grew up, anthropologist sorts, of whom we've heard some from today, um, taught me that perhaps the most distinctive thing between, be, uh, besides our order of reason about humans is our capacity to use tools. But since I grew up over the decades, we know lots of animals use lots of tools in lots of interesting ways. But to be self-transcendent seems, as far as we can make out, since we can't be in the minds of uh, chimpanzees and cheetahs very well, but seems a distinctive human trait. And um, so there's this quest for the divine, and one way we might think of scripture is uh, that it might be thought of as a byproduct of this impulse, self-transcendent creatures seeking transcendent transcendence. This cuts across history and it cuts across diverse cultures. It is good despite the heaviness of the world and the distractions of everyday Claremont, it is good that we gather and consider the role of scripture in the meaning-making, moral-making, symbol-making enterprise that we call religion. My own homework assignment um, for today was to think on the Latter-day Saints and the Bible. The saints make for a disproportionately rich case study for something like this, for religion generally, actually, especially in this country, in this region, where they have had impact beyond their numbers. They make a good case study for a number of reasons we don't need to go into, but one is that they're world champion record keepers, and therefore they've produced a bunch of stuff they're so available for study compared to most other groups. And another is that the Mormons are half familiar and half strange. The Mormons, as the outside world knew, knew the people, I'm one of them, so knew us, um, until uh, recent sensibilities made us uh, step further away from that name. But the Latter-day Saints are half familiar to some parts of the world, certainly to the United States and the Western United States, and they're half foreign, and it's that tension that makes them a particularly attractive, or, or one item that makes them a particularly attractive um, case study for how, for, for religion generally, but for how religion, uh, scripture plays out among the saints. So this all makes for a um, alluring, non-alcoholic cocktail for study, uh, and especially ripe for comparison. We've considered themes today relating to the question of what scripture is, and one way to approach that question is to probe what, uh, to ask what scripture does among any given person or people. How do people use it? Philosopher Richard Mao posited a taxonomy of four preliminary but still primary uses among 20th century Protestants. He said the Protestants were most typically or most prominently using the Bible doctrinally as an intellectual submission to correct beliefs or devotionally, um, pietism he called it, or moralism, the Bible as a source book for personal ethics, or culturalism, scripture as a way of understanding, reading culture, or of the attempt to transform culture. We um, have listened today to many other dimensions, many other uses that help us ask more questions and think about the ones we've already asked 
about what the Bible is. So Mao's is by no means the only taxonomy and we're all stimulated by our exercises today. As a way to biopsy the Latter-day Saints, I thought we might consider an orientation known to all church members as the Eighth Article of Faith. I hoped it might be illuminating to sketch an exegesis before Rosalind all made us afraid of that word um, of this summary. No, I heard you better than that, Rosalind. Um, uh, the idea is, the idea as I'm using the word is to break a statement uh, uh, like the Eighth Article of Faith apart a little bit to consider each key word and phrase and clause and um, make sure we know what is being asserted here and then to reassemble it. That, as Rosalind and others have taught us, is not the only way to go about this project, but it might be one. And... Um, I'm really not going to do that today, but it would be one. And what I'm going to do, rather, because it's too complex for my humble self to do in a short period, um, I am going to give a sketch of what that might look like or some preliminary um, issues that would have to go into that so that we can ask that question together. Please keep in mind that the case is complex for any group, and it's particularly complex for the Latter-day Saints because written canonized scripture is complicated by dimensions in the tradition of oral scripture and private scripture and non-canonized revelation and temporary scripture and uh, extra-biblical scripture, wider canon that uh, exceeded the Bible initially and then became an open canon. What we call the Articles of Faith were generated and published in 1842 as a response to a news editor's request for a summary orientation to Latter-day Saint commitments. Um, Joseph Smith wrote in response, um, it's typically known um, in Latter-day Saint history as the Wentworth Letter and the Articles, what are now known as the Articles of Faith were a series of we believes or one we claim uh, that were extracted from that letter and authored by Joseph Smith. The church canonized this statement, the, this extraction of the we believes, um, and um, published it as part of the Pearl of Great Price, and then a generation after Joseph Smith ar um, authored these statements, canonized it. So we now have a, a canonized statement, a piece of scripture declaring the Bible to be the word of God. Um, and when it got extracted and canonized, then the we believes be took on less a flavor of here's some stuff we believe to orient you, world, world who are persecuting us, who are kicking us out of different places. We're not so different, and here's what we believe. It retreated from that characteristic to a creedal kind of a feel. We believe this, we believe that. Joseph Smith famously um, said he disliked creeds. They bind one in, and I want more freedom than that. And yet the Articles of Faith sort of seem creedal um, in their flavor, and um, virtually all Latter-day Saint young people memorize them, so they're known to old and young very well. We believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it is translated correctly. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God. This is an uncluttered statement. What does it tell us? If our question is, what is the Bible? If we privilege ourselves in the question we've been asking here, we learn that the Bible is posited as the Word of God with two implied or explicit qualifications. There may be issues of translation that would qualify our statement, and the Bible does not stand alone as the Word of God. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God. So all that is simple sounding, but when anything sounds simple, it's a good time to hold on to your wallet. To illustrate that, um, compare the United States Constitution, which Latter-day Saint 
extra biblical scripture, that is the Doctrine and Covenants 101st section, declares in almost so many words to be inspired. The U.S. Constitution is inspired. How inspired is it? Is inspired a way of saying the Constitution is also the word of God? Is it suggesting that it's uniquely, the Constitution is uniquely inspired in relation, say, to other countries' constitutions? Are the amendments to the Constitution inspired as well? And if so, at what point in history? Because the little suckers keep multiplying or contracting. Or does the idea that uh, the Constitution is inspired and amendable imply that it's more fundamentally the process that's inspired about it? Because the amendments both apply to the Constitution and become a part of it, let's assume for a moment from a Latter-day Saint perspective um, that they, the amendments are as inspired as the rest of the Constitution. Um, Congress, the first one begins, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech, and it goes on. Think about our contemporary culture, and we will be given pause. This is beautiful, simple. I'm okay if it's inspired. I like it. And it's succinct and precious and consequential, but history declares that those pithy little clauses were going to need a bit of unpacking. That is to say, a centuries-long exegesis by the courts when it comes time to applying them to real human life. What did the founders intend? Or is that the right question? What should their intent mean for us today? Or is that the right question? Back to the eighth article of faith. If we were to play Supreme Court this afternoon toward this article of faith, what might an exegesis look like? One question is what did its author, Joseph Smith, intend? Or was it God whose intent we need to search out? A separate question would be exegetically, how do we followers understand it? And has this evolved over time? So let's break it apart just for fun. We believe the Bible to be the word of God. We who? We Latter-day Saints, duh. But there are millions of those. There are a lot of them even when this were, there were thousands when this was written. Uh, there are millions now. And they don't all have the same perspective on that, uh, on what follows in this article. They don't all understand scripture in the same light. Um, any Latter-day Saint Sunday school class um, may bear that if you're going to class looking for, it's not just that this person wants to make this point and this person wants to make this point. It's, wow, if I listen to them long enough, I have the idea there's different presuppositions going on beneath the conversation. Is this phrasing, we believe the Bible to be the word of God, I mean, we believe the Bible to be the word of God, is that descriptive of Joseph Smith's orientation or descriptive of the Latter-day Saints or prescriptive? Is it an implied, this is what we believe, right, followers? Uh, you see what I mean? There can be tonality between the words and between the lines. Um, or is this phrasing even political in part or rhetorical in context as an explanation uh, to say to the world, we're not so different from other law-abiding Christians with these two exceptions. Um, we got to get the translation right and there's additional scripture. We believe does that imply intellectual assent to a cre semi-creedal statement? Does it, uh, if it's prescriptive, is it mostly deference to ecclesial authority? 
or do we mean trust, we have faith in? Or like a Latter-day Saint testimony meeting, do we really mean we believe, but those of you who have, have substantive faith know, we know the Bible to be the word of God. We believe the Bible. What Bible? We could turn to Dr. Thewson, we could turn to Dr. Syker, uh, and we already have, so I won't elaborate that one, but which Bible, not which translation here, but um, what Bible? It took centuries for in early Christianity for um, a reasonable consensus to develop in Christianity which books were to um, be considered part of the rule of faith, part of the straight read or canon um, by which we should orient ourselves and be governed by. And uh, actually the issue is unsettled today, or more precisely, it's very settled today, but in a splintered way. The Roman Catholic canon is not identical to the canon that emerged out of the old Greek side of the empire and the Eastern Orthodox churches, and neither of them are identical to the Protestant Bible. We believe the Bible to be the word of God. What do you suppose it means to be? Of all the words that are not self-evident, the short monosyllables are the sneakiest, have the most packed into them, is be, love, God, truth, very sneaky words. So what does it mean to be the word of God? The very bookiness of the book or liquidity of the digitality, I now am thinking freshly about. Um, how to, what does it mean to take a book if I stick with just that example and it's very booky? What does that mean to be the word of God and have it come out in um, this particular form? Does to be the word of God mean stenographically recorded? Does it mean inerrant? Those sorts of battles have been fought in many traditions over many centuries. Do we mean the Bible to, is the word of God? Or the Bible, we believe the Bible to be the word of God means the entire Bible. When those he bears came up out and mangled the young folks who teased Elisha for losing his hairline, um, we, is that the word of God? And what are the implications of that? Does being the word of God imply historicity? Am I to imagine the book of Job as a good Bible-believing Christian or Jew, um, God and Satan shooting pool up in heaven, betting on my life and everything that follows? Does it, is that historical? Or do we mean the Bible, when we say we believe it to be the word of God, do we mean we believe the Bible to contain the word of God or to convey the mind of God? Are there levels of holiness in this statement? We've already heard about the law, the prophets, and the writings. Jews anciently had a hierarchy of scriptures. So, too, Jesus seemed to... Um, distinguish the law and the prophets and their implied levels of authority or um, required loyalty. Um, or if we were to take the, the Bible that's read by the Latter-day Saints um, and collapse it to what is really read by the Latter-day Saints, we, it's, you know, Habakkuk's really underappreciated and I never hear Obadiah quoted in over the pulpit. So um, do we mean the reason of what is actually um, quoted and used actively or the big watermelon uh, that we call the Bible? Um, is the Bible the word of God implying it's uniquely so or is it a word of God? The second clause of the eighth article of faith already suggests an answer. We believe the Bible to be the word of God. Is the Bible the word of God or is it the words of God? And what are the implications in the difference? Does God speak only in words? 
but the Bible, of course, itself portrays other ways, a burning bush, a still, small voice, because the Bible quotes Tom Mould, actually, which is something. Um, God, does God speak through nature? Uh, Gospel of John suggests that God spoke through the logos, um, a Greek word with a great deal of elasticity that can mean word, word, our word logic comes from it, of course, could mean meaning, um, could mean expression. Um, is art a way that God expresses God's self or music? Is a Native American sense of the numinous, the spirit of a place, a way of the divine talking? So the relation of all that to our expression, we believe the Bible to be the word of God. Does that mean to be inspired? Does it mean God breathed as evangelical um, folk uh, particularly are fond of expressing it? And finally, we believe the Bible as far as it is translated correctly. Uh, now, Professor Syker, um talked a good bit about that, so I'm not going to go, I'm going to uh, abridge my um, reflections about that, but do we mean um, by translation the King James version of the Bible for English speakers? That has a number of drawbacks that Professor Syker mentioned. One thing is um, we can fix that with footnotes or cross-references to some degree as in the LDS um, official edition of the Bible. But uh, that doesn't fix that Paul's way of talking can be, if I were a grouchy man, as instead of the sweet spirit that I am, I could say it could be convolute, can be convoluted even in the Greek, um, let alone the uh, translation of antique 17th century English, so there's some drawbacks um, with the King James Version, and yet um, the King James Version is, of course, knitted with the way that Joseph Smith cast his scriptures, um, setting it apart as what sounded like holy language at the time. And I won't even get into how tangled this can all get if we talk about translation into other languages besides English. So. There's those kind of things. A second bit about we believe the Bible to be the word of God as far as it's translated correctly is that's how Joseph phrased it, but he lived, acted, and spoke as though there's a lot more difficulty going on than that, than translation. He was concerned and his um, passages in the Book of Mormon that he ushered into the world were concerned also with those in early Christian centuries who intentionally um, extracted parts of the written scripture or added to it. And um, he also mentioned awareness of copyist errors and entire lost books from the canon. Thus, he was concerned not merely with translation, but with transmission and with the Apocrypha and with correct interpretation of the text. So. We either need to spread out that word translated in the eighth article of faith or simply be aware of more going on. Hence, depending on, if we paused here, because I don't want to do a sketch of an exegesis anymore and tire you, but that's the sort of process. We'd want to pause, figure out what is meant by each word or key clause and what the so what's are, and then we try to reassemble it. And if we paused right here and tried to do it just with some of the issues that I've raised so far, we could reassemble the eighth article of faith to read something like this, which is unwieldy. We Latter-day Saints, in our various and contrasting ways, construe and trust that the Bible, especially the annotated cross-reference 17th century Protestant King James Version for readers of English, is one very important book, among other books, living prophets and other phenomena that convey God's message so far as it is transmissed, translated, and interpreted correctly. So. 
Rosalind and I have our different reasons for not believing in exegesis. One more note on this translated bit, and that'll take the end, uh, take me to the end of my talk, is that there's a little um, more that has to be said about translated correctly. For in all this, Joseph Smith was not translating texts. He was translating something much bigger and much broader. Or to be more precise, his translation of texts has come to seem to me as ultimately in the service of translating this much wider, bigger theme. This bigger thing is a kind of an er text, or rather an er message, or an er point to everything. So I'll close with a comment on, on uh, Smith's method and, the, and the, something of the character of his biblical translation. I won't try to be comprehensive, but suggestive. And then I'll really, really close by what he was really translating, what this theme that he was translating behind and beyond his translating of text, what that consisted of. Both of these things are inextricable from his relation to the Bible, how he used and how he thought of the Bible. Although not through scholarly modes, Joseph Smith did, of course, translate texts, the Book of Mormon, um, is obvious the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible is more immediately to point here, um, to our point. We could, if we had time, look at the characteristics of his translation. He added whole long sessions that don't have biblical precedent in the form that we have the Bible. He made common sense um, changes whenever he saw that the Lord was cast as repenting of something like the evil he was going to do to um, some or another people. Joseph knew that the Lord didn't need to repent of anything. He's God, and so he, he would alter that. He made interpretive additions uh, to Jesus' counsel to turn the other cheek. If smitten, Joseph Smith added, or in other words, it is better to offer the other cheek than to revile again. So... Pay attention through the scriptures if there's or in other words often collapse to or. Uh, you can feel Joseph making interpretive comment there. He harmonized discrepancies. He elevated the sense of the miraculous. Dream gets um, changed to vision. Um, we could give a lot of examples of elevating the miraculous. He eliminated the italics, which the King James um, translators put in to, they tried to have a very literal translation from the Greek and the Hebrew, but whenever they needed more English words to get the idea across, they would cast them in italics, and Joseph often tried to minimize or even do away with those. So we could look at those sorts of traits about his translation, but there are other traits to notice concerning his method and the character of his translating exercise. One trait I'd like to suggest is that there's an experimental strand to it, as suggested by the eighth and ninth sections of the Doctrine and Covenants, um, when his associate Oliver Cowdery wants to translate to, and um, the Lord says, okay, and he goes to do it and fails, and then Joseph um, rewrites section eight and section nine that allude to, behold, you have not understood, you've got to work this out in your mind, study it out in your mind, and um, you'll get a warming of the bosom or you'll get a stupor of thought, let that be your guide. This was um, not quite the process that Oliver recognized. Secondly, there's a targumic quality to Joseph Smith's translation in the Bible, of the Bible in some respects, at least in my judgment. That is to say, not the Bible as it once historically was, but the Bible as it should be in his mind. There are, he said, many things in the Bible that do not comport with revelations I have received. 
Third, this targumic quality can be better understood by the phrase restoration of all things. And this is part of what Joseph Smith was trying to do. And that phrase is borrowed from the third chapter of Acts, the restoration of all things. But other primitivists in antebellum America also used the restoration of all things. There was an entire restoration movement in antebellum America. But Alexander and Thomas Campbell, two of the most prominent restorationists who were not particularly fond of the Latter-day Saints and their stealing of some of their prize preachers, for instance, um, they, when the groups that would become the disciples of Christ or the churches of Christ talked about the restoration of all things, they meant the restoration of all New Testament things and New Testament scripture. Joseph Smith, unbeknownst even to most Latter-day Saints, since we haven't often paused and parsed it out, meant three kinds of things with restoration. In his effort to restore um, all things, he sometimes worked to retrieve that which was lost, which is the way Latter-day Saints do typically understand. You could think of lost scriptures or restoring the primitive church, um, a la the sixth article of faith. A second way he tried, he used the term restoration, or he acted as he tried to initiate the restoration, is to repair that which is broken. Um, kinship and generations and broken economics and a broken language and a broken government trying to establish government, even a broken time, although that's a little bit complicated to go into now. And a third way that he used the concept of restoration, besides retrieving that which was lost and repairing that which was broken, is completing that which is partial, revealing things, as he put it in scripture language, things kept hidden from the foundation of the earth things like pre-existence and theosis or um, the human aspiration to assume the divine nature. And fourth and finally, there's a process that I call, um, my clock, Matt says 5.15, are you telling me I need to quit? Sort of? Yeah, I okay, I'll try to talk very fast and we'll go up for four or five more minutes. Are you enjoying it? Uh, this is a this trait of Joseph Smith's usage is um, something I neologized about. I made up a very ugly word so that you would remember it for the midterm. It's called baraification. Uh, bara is a Hebrew word that Joseph learned when he was studying Hebrew with a fellow named Joshua Sykes in Kirkland in 1835. And uh, that's the word that gets translated create. Some form of vara is for create or created or creation in the first chapter of Genesis. And the second chapter, hmm, I'm not sure if it's in both, version, both first and second chapter, but in the first chapter of Genesis. And the idea, as any of you who know anything about LDS um, theology, is that God as per the Hebrew, did not zap creation into existence ex nihilo, but shaped it, fashioned it, organized it from pre-existing chaotic materials. That's, um, that's bara. And the, the point is that Joseph Smith's prophetic MO, including in translation, um, is bara-like. His prophetic M.O. was patterned after what he taught God's M.O. was in creation. That is, he gathered things from all sorts of scattered, Joseph gathered things from all sorts of scattered conditions, um, chaotic conditions in his mind, fragmented conditions, and, um, and created out of it. So, I'm not going to read this all out loud, but what I want you to notice is the column on the right comes from the Book of Mormon in 2 Nephi and is a coherent thought. It's a coherent passage of scripture 
but it is influenced because we can establish the pattern all through the Book of Mormon and all through the Doctrine and Covenants and all through Joseph's sermons. It is um, taken in part, influenced by chunks of King James Bible language from disparate parts of the Bible. So Joseph has taken carrots from Genesis and potatoes from Isaiah and peas from Matthew or the book of Revelation and he has stirred them up into a new soup and served it for dinner in this passage of the Book of Mormon that has its own integrity, its own meaning. That's what I mean by baratification. He's, he's, grab, he's got a grab bag cooking and it comes out to be a new whole. Um, I'm skipping some other stuff about the Bible because I gotta quit here, but um, my point about baratification is that like a parent bird, I said this once and someone corrected me, father birds make nests too, so uh, a mother or father bird gathers vagrant twigs and debris in order to make a new nest. And that's what Joseph is doing with his translations. Now, um, you can see this barofication process all over the place, but let me finish with um, a comment on Joseph's overall relation to the Bible. Um, he was, Oh, I better fit in one comment instead of read the text. Um, Joseph, um, Joseph's translation, we're still linking back to the eighth article of faith, Joseph's translation process in some respects echoed the biblical prophets, not just in uttering, thus says the Lord of hosts, but Abraham Heschel, maybe the most penetrating, certainly the most poetic and penetrating scholar analyzing um, what Hebrew prophet, prophets were like, what characterized them, said that um, and now I'm going to go blank. Um, said that his analysis had it that um, the prophet gains a fellowship with the feelings of God, sympathy with the divine pathos, a communion with the divine consciousness, which comes about through the prophet's reflection of or participation in the divine pathos. By his analysis, what's going on is some sort of a mind meld with the Hebrew prophets, um, identifying with having compassion with, I'm not very good at that, am I? The divine pathos. So we won't take time to read it here, but do go home and look at the book of Moses in the Pearl of Great Price um, with the encounter of Enoch, who's been shown this panoptic vision of all humanity and maybe all history, um, as Joseph also cast Moses and um, to a lesser degree Nephi um, with his panoptic vision. And read that passage in light of Heschel's definition. There's something going on with Joseph Smith in translation that's identifying with this Enoch as he's got it cast here. Um, so um, I'm ending with this sentence really truly, Matt. The others were just fake. Ernest Hemingway compared his writing after contemplating Cezanne's landscape. As he described, Hemingway says in A Movable Feast, I was learning something from the painting of Cezanne that made writing simple, true sentences far from enough to make stories that made writing simple, true statements far from enough to make the stories have the dimensions I was trying to put in them. Simple true statements were inadequate to the task of what he was trying to say. So um, I'll show you two, um, 
two image themes here. Uh, a mother or a father um, bird making a nest out of twigs and debris. This is rather a beautiful one because this is a bower bird and a bower bird makes big nests out of debris and this one species of bower birds, oh sorry, of bower birds um, lights only blue um, to attract mates. But they make really cool, in fact there's a cool sculpture of vines and things. I wish I knew his name. Have you ever seen that that looked like Hobbit huts? He goes around the country um, with this exhibition. Um, bower birds must have been part of his um, inspiration. Um, they'll do, they don't all have to be blue, they'll do various things to, to attract the mates and various shaped nests. Um, I've picked some beautiful ones, but they're really strange ones if their materials are litter or $10 bill or stuff, you can see it's really squampus nest. I think Joseph Smith's relation to the Bible in one respect we may not have thought about is that he's tethered to it. If he goes out here, he comes back. His figures are biblical figures or Bible-like figures. His terms are completely radically redefined often, but they're biblically linked. Um, so I thought of, uh, and they're barahified. So I thought of a bower, um, bower bird, and I thought of um, Van Gogh, ordinary point, uh, ordinary realism, ordinary impressionism wasn't enough for his purposes. Even even a kind of a cubism, I think, of Joseph Smith breaking things around, achieving anachronisms that are not hidden, that are bold and in your face and kind of crazy. I think um, some part of him is lurching towards, evolving towards, not tr translating text in the service of trying to translate the point, what God does for a living, what the human role is in the cosmos, uh, he's trying to mend a broken reality or a fractured reality. And the gospel that he ushered into the world is not, um, not finally just about trying to be righteous and but sinning and having atonement and a resurrection. Those are essential elements of a wider thing. Um, his gospel is about reality and attempt to to shape, to characterize existence. Um, I think that if you go up to 30,000 feet in the hot air balloon and say, why is this all so weird and funny? That's because that's the project, not often what we think it is. Sorry for going over time. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you, Phil. As uh, I was listening to this, it tied a number of ideas that I think we shared today together, right? And, and we started with this question of what scripture is. How do we define this category? Is it even definable? Um, we've heard a lot, and I think what Phil has given us here is a sense of scripture is something, something aesthetic um, and effective, um, in a way that I think many of these other presentations we have heard have touched on. And that leaves us, I suppose, no closer to a definitive answer. Um, but there's something, I think, powerful about meditating with that concept and seeing how it changes people and how people change themselves in relation to it. Um, so I think we are just about at time, so we will wrap up. Um, I want to again thank the CGU staff who did really heroic work getting all of our wonderful presenters here um, and Anthony Penta for doing the recording for us. Um, also of course to our wonderful presenters who gave us a real I think feast um, to work through together and finally as well the Brownlee family and the Chen family um, for their generosity in making uh, this really extraordinary day possible. So uh, please join me in thanking all of them. <laughs>